Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Fertility Docs Uncensored. I am Dr. Carrie Bedian from the Fertility Center of Las Vegas, joined by my two stunning, sensationally sexy, stellar co-hosts, Dr. Abby Eblin from Nashville Fertility Center. Hey, everybody. And Dr. Susan Hudson from Texas Fertility Center. Hello, hello. So today we have had several listeners as well as our own personal patients ask if we could make an episode that y'all can send to your friends and your family as you are going through this process. And so what we're going to do today is just a little bit different than our usual structure. Um, And we're going to kind of do a high level overview of what the IVF process is. And so um, hopefully this will be easy for you to send to the people that you love um, so that they kind of know what you're going through. So you don't necessarily have to give that explanation for the umpteenth millionth time. (laughs) So to start with, let's, let's give everybody an idea of kind of who we are and how we got to where we are right now with the training and all of the, the stuff that goes being the go, the stuff that goes with being an REI. I'll kind of start this off. So when your friend or family member is going through fertility treatment, they are usually seeing somebody called a reproductive endocrinologist and infertility specialist. We refer to ourselves as REIs to make it simple (laughs) because that definitely- Not to be confused with the sporting goods store. (laughs) Exactly. Not to be confused with the sporting goods store. So just a little bit of background. Um, Generally, all of us have, of course, undergraduate degrees, and then we all went to medical school. And then we went through OB-GYN residency, which is a four-year training program. Um, we all travel- Obstetrics and gynecology, if you don't know what gin is. Exactly. <laughs> it is not the nope. type of cocktail. Although I swear <laughs> every time, Susan, you say that, I laugh because I'm like, I wonder what that cocktail is made of. <laughs> <laughs> I need to make my own cocktail called an ob <gasps> Yeah, that's a great idea. Yes, I'm going to serve that at Thanksgiving this year. <laughs> ob Hmm. I'll have to start finagling. Yeah. (laughs) Good stuff. And after we finished that, which is what your general OB-GYNs who see women for well woman exams, they deliver babies, all of those types of things. We went on and did an additional three years of fellowship training where we specifically learned about things like infertility. And after that is when we started actually practicing in some of the practices we're in today. So if you count that, that's 15 years of training before we're ever allowed to be a fully functional, independent doc. And I'll add to that. What we do is we try and help someone get pregnant, but we don't keep them. We we follow them usually till about six or eight weeks of pregnancy. And while we all know how to deliver babies, we don't do that anymore. So we send um, your friend or relative back to the obstetrician so that they can have a healthy delivery. We just get them pregnant. Yep. Okay. So what has the patient who is landed in our office, how do they land in their office? Like why, why do they end up with us rather than just with their regular OBGYN, OBGYN or OBGYN, depending on which part of the country you're from? (laughs) Well, they end up there because basically they've usually tried to get pregnant. And and the definition of infertility is if a woman can't get pregnant within a year of trying, meaning no birth control, having sex for a year. So if, if someone is in that category and they're under 35 or if they're over 35 and they're in that category and they've tried for six months, then those are patients who generally are considered as infertile. Sometimes they'll stop at, stop, start with their um, gynecologist And sometimes treatments can be done in the gynecologist office, but generally after a few months, if they're not pregnant with some minor treatments there, usually they get sent to our office for more intensive diagnostic testing and treatment. There's some additional people who also have some kind of unique challenges, Um, people who have recurrent pregnancy loss. So they have had at least two miscarriages. And then there's some people who just need help because of their circumstance. Um, Sometimes that's because of location where partners aren't necessarily in the same places at the same times, or if somebody's needing to use something like donor eggs or donor sperm or gestational carriers because of their specific clinical situation. Sometimes um, people have diagnoses coming in that they know about. So Susan touched on this a little bit. PCOS is probably the other. PCOS and endometriosis are the really common ones where if someone's not having a period, 
Um, they end up in our office a lot sooner just because if you're not having a period, it's a lot harder to get pregnant. Not impossible, but a lot harder. So what is the 10,000 foot overview of the testing they need? What are the, the kind of four general areas that we need to test and what's like the one liner on how we get each one of them? So I'll start. So we want to test sperm. Um, we want to make sure that the, that the male partner, if there's a male partner produces sperm, we want to make sure that the female partner has eggs and ovulates regularly, meaning she can grow those eggs and release a mature egg every month so that she has the ability to get pregnant with that egg. And then we also want to check the fallopian tubes to make sure they're open. And at the same time with the testing that we do, we can also test the uterine cavity as well. And there's some different versions of testing that we can do, but those are really the basic ones that we've done for many, many years. Um, and there's some newer ones. There's a test that actually looks at sperm function called the sperm QT test. So that gives us a sense for whether or not the sperm can actually get into the egg and bind to and penetrate the egg, regardless of the number of sperm. So even if there's a lot of sperm, sometimes we find that sperm can't penetrate. Um, so that's one of the tests that we do. And then um, we also, when we do testing of the uterus and the fallopian tubes, we either can do it through an x-ray test called an HSG or hysterosalpingogram. That's done by a radiologist. It's where the radiologist puts dye up inside the uterine, uterus and sees the dye spill out of the fallopian tubes. We can also do a procedure in the office that has different names, but essentially it's where we put fluid or water up inside the cavity and we're able to open the cavity up, kind of like blowing air in a balloon. And we can see if there's any lumpy, bumpy areas like polyps or fibroids, scar tissue. And then we can also test and make sure the fallopians or tubes are open by watching the air go through the fallopian tubes. When we're testing the eggs, we usually do a combination of some blood tests as well as doing an ultrasound to look at the structure of the ovaries as well. So once we get all of this testing done and someone is talking about what kind of treatment that they can go through, what is the absolute simplest type of treatment that you can do fertility wise? So kind so of the absolute... Oh, go ahead, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> so starting off on the simple end, um, we often use oral or oral and injectable medications to help recruit or grow follicles. So follicles are the houses of the eggs and the ovaries um, to grow those follicles, help eggs release, and either use that with either timed intercourse or something called IUI or intrauterine insemination. And the decision on those two things are just based on different very specific clinical scenario um, based on the individual couple. There's a lot of factors going into this, um, which we discuss with the individual or couple um, when we put all of that testing together to see if either of those types of treatments are a reasonable place to start. And the advantage I would add with those are they're less expensive and less involved. And so most couples would prefer to start with those treatments. But like Susan said, not everybody can do that because of their specific situation. A lot of times our kind of motto is the least invasive, but the most appropriate. And so sometimes that least invasive, but most appropriate bypasses those easier things and then goes straight to something like IVF or in vitro fertilization. So what's the, what's the one liner on IVF? Like if you, if you had an elevator pitch to describe IVF, what would it be? So IVF is a way for us to uh, stimulate the woman, retrieve eggs, put the eggs and the sperm together, and basically create an embryo in our lab. And then we can also genetically test that embryo to give that couple the best possible chance for pregnancy. So let's talk about a couple of those words real quick, because people get confused with these all the time, all the time. What is the difference between an egg and an embryo? So an egg comes from a woman's ovary and it contains her genetic material, whereas an embryo is what is formed after egg and sperm come together. And there's the combination of that genetic material from the sperm and the egg together. Okay. So can you test eggs individually? Like, can you tell if each egg is good? Not really. Unfortunately, really, we can just look at morphologically kind of the shape and what it looks like, but you really can't, we can't really make any assumption that one egg is better than the other based on just that. Okay. So let's say somebody is thinking about the success rates as, as they go through all of this. 
first things first, we, we kind of divide people up by the woman's age and it's very, it's completely unfair. We realize that we, it's just how the biology works. So we're kind of stuck with it. And so for the purposes of this conversation, let's assume that everyone's under 35 because 35 is a somewhat arbitrary, somewhat magical, but somewhat realistic number age to go by. So if someone is under the age of 35, they have no fertilities whatsoever. This is the very first month that they're attempting to get pregnant. What kind of success rate will they have per month? Within the first year of trying, they're generally going to have about a 15 to 20% chance of getting pregnant per month. Now the highest chances are in the first six months, and then the chances drop in the second six months. And once somebody has been having unprotected intercourse for a year, those chances go down to about one to 2% per month without help. Okay. So by the time people are in our offices, we're looking at a one to 2% chance per month. Now let's say they decide to go with the absolute simplest type of treatment where they're doing just plain Clomid pills or letrozole, different type of pills, and they're timing intercourse. Like that's it. There's no other intervention. What kind of success rates do those couples have? Assuming that everything else works, tubes are there, sperm's there, all of that. So again, in a couple that's the female partner's 35 or younger, probably somewhere around 15% or 10 to 15%, but probably closer to 10% if they're doing ovulation induction with insemination. What about if they're doing it without insemination? Probably drop by about 5%. Yeah. So you're looking at about 1% to 2% without any intervention, approximately 5% with pills alone, and then 10 to 15% if they're doing pills plus an injection shot to release the, the egg and an insemination, which is taking the sperm, kind of cleaning it up, like separating it out from the fluid, putting a very small amount of tolerable fluid, and then put, placing it into the uterus. So that gets you to about 10 to 15%. Now, what if you're doing IVF? What are your success rates with that? So with, a, chrom- so with a chromosomally normal embryo, we're going to have about a 60 to 70% chance of success, um, regardless of the age. But the biggest factor there is getting a chromosomally normal embryo. So if we are less than 35, our chances of getting that chromosomally normal embryo are going to be higher than somebody who's in their upper thirties or early forties. And once we start getting into, you know, the 42, 43, 44, 45 range, those numbers start getting much, much smaller. And that's female age you're talking about. Yes. So how does male age play into this? Do we care? We do. I mean, sperm doesn't work perfectly as men age, but we see a a much more dramatic shift with female age um, because the, the female is born with all the eggs that she'll ever have. And so over time, the egg number declines and the quality declines. And specifically with the call quality, we mean the genetic makeup of the eggs. Um, when a woman gets the trigger to release the egg, all of a sudden the egg has to divide perfectly in two and kicks has to kick out half of the chromosomes to make way for the sperm. And that's really the process that really starts to go downhill or decline um, in women really between the ages of 30 to 40. And then as Susan said before, beyond 40, really, really hard to find a genetically normal egg in a woman at that point. When guys get around 45, we do start seeing some age-related changes and kind of maybe things that could affect the health of that future child. Um, Not things that are absolute, but we know there's there's some inherent higher risks. Plus, as we get older, um, whether we're male or female, we end up having more exposures um, and more health problems that can affect, especially the the production of sperm, um, just because guys make new sperm about every 72 days. So if, you know, you're 45 or 50, and you've got some high blood pressure, or some diabetes or some obesity, or you have work exposures, those things start to add up and can definitely affect your chances of conceiving with things short of IVF. So once someone gets to the point where they've decided, okay, we're going to take the plunge and we're going to do IVF, what are the two general phases of IVF that you go through? So the first one is actually creating the embryo. So as Susan said before, that's where the egg and the sperm, sperm is donated by the male, harvested in the, the eggs are harvested from the female. We put both of those together and the embryo spend about five days in our labs growing. Then we take cells from the embryo 
we freeze the embryo. And then there's about a four week window where we're waiting for genetic information. And what we want to find is either 46XX, which is a normal female, 46XY, which is a normal male. And so we're waiting on that for about four weeks. And then the second part of that is doing the embryo transfer. Instead of focusing on stimulation of the ovaries, we're actually focused on thickening the lining of the endometrium. So if you think of an embryo like a seed, the lining is like the soil. And so we want to thicken that lining to make it a really nice place for an embryo to, to live. And so we do a procedure no, known as a frozen embryo transfer because that embryo has been frozen. We thaw it out and we transfer it inside the uterus. And then generally about two weeks after that, we're able to find out whether or not our patient is pregnant or not. So Susan, if one of our listeners knows that their friend is starting their egg retrieval cycle, mm -hmm. what is their friend about to go through to get those eggs out? Presumably it's more than just a trip to the grocery store with <laughs> you know, two dozen eggs returning in a cute little cardboard box. It, it would be lovely if we could make it that yeah. easy. So, and hopefully someday we will. We're, we're really excited about things like that on the horizon. But realistically, um, what usually happens is um, when they start their stimulation cycle, they will start going to the doctor about every two to three days for ultrasounds and blood work to get monitored. Those are usually pretty quick appointments, but they, they are something that takes a little bit of time. And the other big thing to be aware of is these women undergoing the IVF stimulation are doing injections every evening. And so these injections are usually about the same time every evening. And most women are going to do injections for somewhere between 10 to 12 days as an approximation. Some people a little shorter, some people a little bit longer, but that's a, a good rule of thumb. Now, one thing to know is that in, in this part of the, of the process, really the eggs are calling the shots. So this is a part that can be very stressful. Both Abby and I not only are fertility doctors, but we went through <laughs> IVF ourselves. So yes. I can, I can tell you that like not knowing what day your egg retrieval is going to be on is unbelievably hard to um, grasp when you're a patient, because you want to know exactly when things are going to happen. And, you know, there's so many things that are outside of our control and this is, this is a big one. And so Usually we know at least two days before the egg retrieval that the egg retrieval is going to happen, but it truly is based on kind of the big picture of what's happening in um, her ovaries. And so when the ovaries say, hey, we look beautiful, we're, we're ready to go, that's when um, all of the, the magic starts happening. So when we are thinking about the numbers, and Abby, you touched on this a little bit, oftentimes people will say, oh, you know, how many eggs are you going to get as, as if we have perfect control over that? So <laughs> can you talk a little bit about the numbers of eggs that we can get and what that means for embryo numbers down the line? So I always tell my patients before I go into and do an egg retrieval, I always say the egg is microscopic. It's only one cell big. It would be like looking at your hand and being able to count how many cells are in your hand. You can't do that. So we definitely can't see the egg cell when we're doing egg retrievals. And so we're looking through an ultrasound screen. We know the size of that house around the egg, like Susan said, the follicle. So it's a fluid filled sac that contains the egg. We can see those egg houses. And so we put our needle in each one of those. We aspirate fluid and we hope in that process, we also aspirate the egg. Although we kind of have to work for it. We have to turn the needle, we call it curetting to kind of scrape the wall down and hopefully get the egg out. And so really at the end of it, we can have a guess based on the size of the follicles in terms of how many eggs it will get. But I always say it doesn't really count until we see them sitting in the Petri dish because we really never know for sure. And then once we get the eggs, though, that's not the end of it. I think a lot of media sources recently would suggest that if you get 15 eggs, you're going to have 15 babies. And we all know that that's not true because as Carrie says, it's a funnel effect. We sh you start out with maybe, you know, depending on your age, if you're lucky, 12 to 15 eggs. And by the end of all those steps, and there's about five days of developmental steps that the embryo goes through, by the end of those steps, um, ultimately, you're lucky if you have somewhere between maybe two to four embryos um, that are viable, that are ones that can be used. And we would only transfer one of those at a time, not, not multiple ones. So when someone comes out of a retrieval and let's say for sake of easy numbers, they've. Let's talk about what an egg retrieval is first. That's okay, a good idea. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> Go so Carrie, what's what, tell us a little bit about an egg retrieval. 
Oh, geez. Okay. So for an egg retrieval, that is a procedure that's typically done under anesthesia so that she's comfortable as she goes through that. So, you know, she comes in nothing to eat or drink the eight hours before comes into our office, gets fitted with a beautiful designer gown, a matching hat and booties, uh, an IV for cocktails for the best drink she's ever had before noon. Um, these are typically done in the morning because everything that follows, you know, happens several hours later. So we try and do them early so that our embryologists have time to work. And then once she's asleep, we go in with a needle, uh, with an ultrasound that's got a special needle on the end. And we go through and take this special needle that goes through the wall of the vagina directly into the ovaries. So a lot of people think, oh, you've got to go up through the uterus and over through the tubes and down into the ovaries. That's not how it works. We we take the shortcut, which in this case <laughs> is a legitimate shortcut, um, and go from the wall of the vagina straight into the ovary because the ovaries have fallen down into a place where we can catch them easily. And then with the ultrasound, we know exactly where to go. So we directly go into each follicle. It's kind of like puncturing a uh, balloon in a slow leak. And so we drain the <laughs> fluid from the follicle and it gets placed into a tube, a test tube, and handed off to our embryologist. H hence the phrase test tube baby. Test tube baby. <laughs> and so, um, which, by the way, nobody uses that term anymore. <laughs> which absolutely nobody uses <laughs> that, that term anymore. That is very antiquated. <laughs> yes. Um, and so once we have those eggs out, the patient wakes up, goes back to the recovery room, no work that day, no driving, no major life decisions, no taking care of other human beings, large or small. Um, I always give my patients, so my clinic is in Las Vegas. I always tell people no going down to the strip, no gambling and no dancing on tables. Um, <laughs> probably the more realistic. Hey, I'm going to start using that in Nashville, Carrie. I'm going to say that too, because we have a lot of the same stuff there. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It no never fails stepping. to get a smile. Um, the what is actually probably a more realistic set of cautions is after anesthesia, no unattended online shopping. <laughs> that and, can be dangerous. Uh, yeah. Um, and no gym and no sex, because until she gets her period, her ovaries are still going to be really big. So we want her we don't want her to be stuck in bed like she can still go to, you know, most desk jobs, office jobs, things like that, teaching, stuff like that. Um, but we don't want her out there running a marathon by any stretch of the imagination. And so um, when someone comes out of a retrieval, it's, it's like any minor procedure. And how much, ladies, you both can answer this, how much does this process hurt versus feel uncomfortable versus feel emotionally uncomfortable? I would say the emotional uncomfortableness for me was not knowing exactly when my egg retrieval was going to be. It was really hard to, you know, I mean, I was a doctor and I was trying to plan my patients and take care of, you know, like we all do try to take care of everybody else before ourselves. Mm -hmm. And this is definitely a time that, that the person going through really needs to kind of put themselves first. Um, when it actually came to pain towards the end of the stimulation, it was like, uncomfortable, you know, you didn't want to wear something tight. You want to wear your, your sweats and, you know, comfy clothes day of the egg retrieval was kind of achy and crampy. But then after that, it was, it was pretty okay for me. Yeah. I think the emotional part was just trying to, like Susan said, make sure that all the T's were crossed and I's were dotted. Like if I'm going to go to my egg retrieval tomorrow, or if it can be the following day. And so that was a little bit nerve wracking. And, and I think it's true for most of our patients too, because they work, many of them work full time. And it's just, you're trying to make sure that you've got everything covered before you go out. I think the day of the egg retrieval, I was a little bit crampy, but really what it felt like to me is that I'd done a bunch of sit-ups. It just like my abs just felt really, really sore, but it was so bizarre. Like within 24 hours, it was, I kind of felt back, you know, reasonably back to normal. I could still feel my ovaries. They still felt enlarged. I still felt almost like really bloated. Like you feel in the second half of your menstrual cycle for, you know, a few days. And then after that, it just kind of went away and you didn't, I didn't really notice it that much anymore. This is just a, a, a piece of advice. I, I did my IVF traveling across country, which if you don't have to do that, I would not recommend doing it if you can find something close to home. Some people live far away from everything. So sometimes travel is necessary. Um, I would not recommend trying to fly out on an airplane the day of your egg retrieval. Um, we attempted that and it didn't work because there ended up being a snowstorm. Oh, wow. Um, but it was one of those, like everything happens for that reason. I think that snowstorm was to keep me from flying that day. Cause I really wasn't any, it, like 
I was, I was post anesthesia. I mean, I, I remember like laying down in the taxi on the way to the airport and I'm like, that's not what you need to be doing when you're going through, um, you know, the middle of your process. Well, one other thing I learned from that experience too, I mean, while it can be done, it doesn't mean it's a good idea. And so I'll have a lot of patients that are planning to go back to work the next day. And I, you can do that. And people, some people do that, but I wouldn't recommend that. And I really emphasize that to patients because your ovaries are really big. And it's like walking around with a size eight foot in a size five shoe all day, your ovaries rubbing up against your abdominal wall when you're moving and it just doesn't feel good. And so if you can take the day off, I really would try to, because you just, you need that time. You need to, to recover a little bit. What's the one liner on the hormones and the medications that people go through for this? Because I hear a lot of people tell me that, oh, you know, my insert person I love and I'm close to here is really worried about me going through all of these hormones. So realize that the amount of hormones we are giving you during that week and a half is kind of a drop in the bucket compared to what you're going to experience during pregnancy. And you know, I know people are always worried about cancer risks and things like mm-hmm. this, and it's really looking like it's you're, you're, you have life in life, you have cancer risks. And it's one of those, if you do something, you're going to have some risks. And if you don't do something, you're going to have risks. And so there are actually very hormonally related cancers that if you do not achieve a pregnancy, you're actually at a higher risk of getting some of those. Like breast cancer, for example. (laughs) Exactly. Like breast cancer. And so I think under reasonable controlled circumstances and needing to do this to help you achieve a pregnancy, there is a risk to everything you do, including walking out your door. It's a relatively low risk of something bad happening because of those hormones. But I would, I would even say further, there's no specific link between what we do and, you know, doing one IVF cycle and breast cancer risk or one IVF cycle and ovarian cancer risk and even several cycles. So I think, I think you can be assured that when people do this, the chances are really, really low. And again, compared to what you're going to experience during pregnancy, it's a drop in the bucket. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So let's move on to the second part of all of this in the transfer. So if someone is going through a transfer cycle, what does that mean? So that's where we use medicines, um, usually a combination of things called estrogen and progesterone to make the lining a perfect environment for an embryo to reside. It usually takes us about three weeks two to three weeks to get things right, um, where they need to be. Um, it's less invasive, like that people aren't having to go to as many office visits, usually a couple of office visits, couple of blood draws instead of every two to three days, um, during this time frame. And when everything is perfect, we go back for the embryo transfer. And what we're really doing is we're, we're lining up the stage of the embryo with the stage that the uterus needs to be to have implantation happen. And implantation is essentially where the embryo sticks to the uterus and begins to start making all those little hormonal and physical connections between mother and baby. So does every embryo that's transferred become a baby? Unfortunately not. We wish that was the case, but in most of our practices, I think we could say, like Susan said, somewhere between 65 to 70% implantation and, and ongoing pregnancy rate, actually. So meaning a baby in your arms at the end of nine months. So those numbers may not sound great, but those are way better than they were even you know 10 years ago and certainly much better than they were 15 or 20 years ago. So the, the success is getting better and better, but it's not at hundred percent quite yet for each embryo. Tell me about the genetics testing that we do. So if you want a child that is, you know, six feet tall with purple hair and green eyes <laughs> with uh, violet lips or whatever, can you get that? No. <laughs> so the genetic testing that we do most of the, so the genetic testing we do is something called PGT or pre-implantation genetic testing. Now there are some extra letters that go after those to kind of describe the specifics. Most of the PGT testing we do is looking for um, what we call aneuploidy. So making sure there's the right number of chromosomes, which Abby talked about earlier 
to make a chromosomally normal baby. Okay. And we know that a lot of those embryos are not even in somebody who's 20 something, we expect about half of the embryos we create in an IVF cycle to be chromosomally abnormal. And as we age, especially over that age 35, we're going to have a higher and higher percentage. And so what we're trying to do is figure out out of the embryos that make it to the day five, six, or seven stage after that egg retrieval happens of those that remain that have showed their hardiness, um, which ones are chromosomally normal. And those are the ones that, that we go forward with embryo transfer. All right. So once somebody has a transfer and they get pregnant, so they have a positive HCG level, they're totally done, right? We've done our job. There's nothing more to do. No, unfortunately, we wish that was true. Um, unfortunately, people can still get pregnant with IVF and even have a positive pregnancy level. Uh, but unfortunately, it still doesn't end up as a viable baby. And so we follow hormone levels and make sure they at least double, ideally, every two days. And generally, we follow them for three and maybe four visits every other day. Once those hormone levels look like they have gone up appropriately, usually a week and a half to two weeks later, we'll schedule that patient for an ultrasound to really see if we can see a, uh, something in the uterus. And if we schedule it around the six week mark, we hope that we're going to see a baby with actually with a little heartbeat at that point. And once we see that, it's no, there's never any guarantee until the baby's in your arms. But once we see that, we think there's a really high percentage of or high percentage of times that that baby will be a healthy baby. So seeing the heartbeat is really, really a big milestone um, in in the baby. So during that time frame, your friend or family member is continuing those medications, those hormones that we talked about, the estrogen and the progesterone, and usually those are continued somewhere between eight to 10 weeks. It varies from practice to practice and doctor to doctor. Um, there's a lot of variation in, in the specifics of what happens in the IVF process. And that's one of those things. And another thing to know, because Abby was talking about most of the time, that's how we get a healthy baby, that even when we do chromosome testing, okay, number one, it's right 98 plus percent of the time. Okay. So there's a small percentage of the time. It may not be accurate. And also know that not all birth defects are chromosomally related. So sometimes there's genes, sometimes there's just things that don't form normally. And so though we often and normally get a healthy baby, that's not always the case, just as when people are, are getting pregnant on their own. So for family and family members and friends, especially, what can they do to support their people in this time? I think the key word is support. I mean, you really just want to, you know, you can't make, I mean, this is a stressful time for both partners, the female partner, both physically and emotionally for the male partner emotionally. And I think anything that you can do to encourage them and give them hope and just let them lean on you and just let them have somebody to talk to, I think I think will be really helpful. You may not know the ins and outs of all the details of what we talked about, but at least you have a better idea now of kind of all the steps that are involved. It's not just like Susan said at the beginning, it's not like going to the grocery store and getting, you know, 12 eggs and bringing them home. And so it's a lot for them to go through. And generally it's for a lot of couples, if they're very young couples, it may be one of the first really difficult things they've dealt with in their marriage. So I think as a supportive friend or parent, you know, just be there for them for whatever they need, whatever that is. Sometimes they need help with doing their shots if a partner is going to be out of town. Sometimes just sending a text message saying, you know, we love you and we're a phone call away if you, you need anything. Sometimes those are the most important things because it, it can be very isolating going through mm -hmm. this process, especially when maybe, you know, other people in the family haven't had trouble conceiving. Um, and you've spent years having people being like, oh, why aren't you having a baby? Um, you know, <laughs> that, relax. That, go on vacation. Yeah. yeah. That, you know, I, I think not necessarily giving advice, but giving a shoulder to lean mm -hmm. on is, is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes giving a ride can be really helpful. Or if this is a coworker, colleague, giving them a little bit of grace when they say, okay, I've got to 
you know, my clinic opens at six or six 30, but I have to be there for a seven o'clock or seven 30 shift, like giving them a little bit of grace because they're coming, going to come in a little bit later and they can still work the same day. It's just, they mean, they may need a little bit of grace there in order to make their appointments and still be able to go through all the stuff that they're going through, that their clinic is giving them a day or two notice because we only get a day or two notice of what they need. And so that kind of grace is really helpful. A ride home, somebody to look after them on the day of retrieval um, can be really helpful. You know, sometimes even just dropping off uh, an I love you, I care basket can be helpful. Just the things that don't necessarily require them to interact because they, it's highly likely they've got a bunch of people in their life who have absolutely no idea about this and trying to explain it again and again and again gets very wearing. And so, you know, which is the whole reason we're doing this particular podcast. So we can help provide that information (laughs) and, and take some of the load off of our, our, our people who are struggling with these challenges. And if you have additional questions about all of this, we've got almost 250 episodes of our podcast. And so there are episodes that focus on people who have tubal blockage, people who have PCOS, endometriosis, who need IUIs, who are LGBTQIA+, who need egg and sperm donation, GCs, all of those things. And so if there's something you want more detail on, most of our episodes are way more detailed than this. Um, but look around our website, fertilitycensored.com, um, fertilitydocsuncensored.com, excuse me. And, and there's a lot of extra information there that's for you that can hopefully make you be a little more informed, a little more aware of what's going on and support your person. All right. Are there any other big topic things that we did not go through ladies that we should touch on that somebody needs to know about their person going through IVF? I think we did. I think it's a, it's a good, it's a good summary. All right. Perfect. Well, to our listeners, thank you so much for tuning in. We are very appreciative and let us know um, if you have ideas, thoughts, um, I plans for what shows we should do, check us out on fertilitydocsuncensored.com and leave us a like on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. You know, we are here to help. And we will answer questions if you have those. We answer them from listeners and we'll be happy to answer questions from you as well. So um, get in touch with us at fertilitydocsuncensored.com. We'd love to hear from you. As always, this podcast is intended for entertainment and is not a substitute for medical advice from your own physician. All right. We'll talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.